I'd like to start uh, uh, by introducing Roberto Pache, who's a professor of physics and astronomy at UCLA, formerly the vice chancellor of research at UCLA, vice president of the Club of Rome. Uh, Roberto, please. Thank you, Gary. We were asked to remark on two questions today. Uh, first of all, what kind of economies and society we need in order to operate within the boundaries of a finite planet? And the second, how do we rediscover a harmonious relationship between humanity and nature? And I think if you think of both of those questions, the answer to both of those questions lies in how we address the issue of growth. Now, it's clear about it. You cannot operate within planetary boundaries if the world population continues to grow. You cannot have a finite system and have something just continues to grow. However, we cannot also remain within these boundaries if we do not alter our present economic system, since that is also a driver beside population of, of the system. Now, this is a more difficult thing to address because in our society we believe that curtailing this activity is a contradictory thing, but in fact we must attempt to do something of that sort. Now, in terms of the population part, I think we are in much better shape than in terms of the economic part. Uh, indeed, we may be going towards a demographic transition. Uh, in the 40, 20 years since the uh, Cairo Conference on Population, the population grew from 7.7 .7 billion to 7.2 billion. Uh, but at the same time, there was a decrease of, of fertility in women, which in fact, in, in, in the last 40 years, uh, the, the, the fertility of women, that is the number of births per woman, went from 4.5 down to 2.5. And so this gives you hope that indeed the world population may be approaching a, a, a demographic transition. If you extrapolate present trends uh, of, of, of our population, including, including the fertility, you uh, estimate, at least the UN estimates, that we will have something like 9.6 billion people in the year 2050. Now, it is very important what exactly you put in for, for the fertility rate of women. If you add half a child on average, you end up by uh, not, 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 not uh, having 9.6 billion in the year 2050, you end up by having almost 11 billion in the year 2050. If you subtract half a child but for, from a fertility curve, what you get is instead of 9.6 billion, you get 8.4 billion. And clearly there's tremendous difference what a world of 8.4 billion will be in 2050 compared to a world of 11 billion. One is uh, a, a world that is going toward a, a, a real demographic transition. The other is a world which gives us tremendous difficulties. Now, one of the important things is that uh, changing population or, or, or helping make this, this, this transition toward a, a, a more stable world population is an achievable goal because one knows practically that more educated women have lower fertility. And indeed, there's a very nice study by two people from Yasa, KC and Lutz, that show that if you have more uh, the more, more girl education and, and, and more economic opportunity for, for, for girls, you can affect the, uh, the, the fertility curves in such a way that you will have about a billion less people than what the UN projects. That is, this half a, a child is in fact an achievable thing for, for women's education. So that's a, a place that where there is, that there is, I think, some real hope. On the other hand, to mitigate the, and reverse the ecological impact of this continuous uh, increasing econ economic activity is very much more difficult. And in part it's difficult because you do not know what the final answer for the economy will be. There are certain concepts like return on investment or compound interest that always say that you're growing. But how can you have that in a, in a world that is supposed to be not driven by growing forces? Uh, so, although it's very difficult to figure out what the final economy may be, what is more likely is to think through, and indeed that's some of the things that Graham, Graham Exton was telling you today, is try to think what will ameliorate the transition. And I think there are four things that I would like to remark very briefly here on, on how to ameliorate this, this transition. One has to do how you manage resources, one has to do how you deal with climate change, 
One has to do with what you do, how you deal with ecosystem, and finally the last one has to do with the financial sector. I will just talk about the management of resources, and I'll talk about climate change, and and, and leave perhaps the other two for for, for the discussion. Uh, it is clear that we must manage the world resources in a much better way than we're doing now. Uh, we have been spendthrift where we, where we should be thrifty with resources. Resources at some point will, 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 will end, and so we must husband them at, at best. And so it is quite important to, in fact, uh, use efficiency to try to use resources the, the, the least possible. And indeed, uh, if you can uh, use efficiency and then do not lose what you gain by efficiency by then consuming more, uh, there is a good chance that in fact you, 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 you can go forward. More important is also to try to re rethink through how you manufacture things and sort of reuse uh, uh, what, what you produce. Go much more to a leasing kind of a mentality instead of a buying mentality. Who needs a drill? You will use a drill for six minutes a year. Perhaps you should lease a drill or similar things of that sort. So we are very, uh, uh, we have a very unhealthy attitude to our resources. We, we're in a throwaway society. We must learn, learn much more to husband uh, things and indeed to think through processes from the beginning to be more of a circle economy uh, idea. On climate change, my comment is that it is extremely important that we make this transition. In fact, if you know the answer, why should you go in that direction? It is clear that if you ask anybody, 100 years from now, we will not be on a carbon economy. So why don't we start now in that path and, and, and do it in the most uh, efficient way possible? Uh, Girl Ritter talked a little bit about the efforts of the states to do different things. I live in California, and California is a good example of doing things, even though others are, have not yet started in this path. And our governor has a free plan, three-point plan, for uh, improving climate by the year 2030. Now, whether, of course, California cannot improve it by itself, but they can take steps that if others follow, Will, will 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 help. So so his, his three point plan is 50 percent, 50 percent, and 50 percent. The first 50 percent is to make sure that in fact uh, our electricity generation is done by 50 percent renewable. This is much more than than than, uh, than other goals. This is by the year 2030, 15 years from now. 50 percent is a decrease in actual consumption of fossil fuel for transportation. That means really a tremendous amount of electric cars and different means of transportation in California. And 50% is increasing the efficiency in buildings, which, which are still quite, quite inefficient. Now, will we get, uh, will that plan pass the legislature, will it be modified? Of course, but that's part of the process. If you do not start the process now, you'll never get there.